Good evening, and thank you for joining us at HCAM for Educate Hopkinton's Know Your Vote Pre-Town Meeting Question and Answer Forum. My name is Tara Sanda, and I'm the president of Educate Hopkinton. Educate Hopkinton was founded in 2007 and is an organization whose purpose is to gather and share information concerning school and town budgets with the citizens of Hopkinton. We want to inform people of anything that may affect their tax dollars. We are a group of individuals who realize that we can have an impact on the future of this town. Recognizing that it is possible for every season, citizen to become fully informed on every issue, we made it our mission to provide accurate, timely, and relevant information that is easily accessible using social media. We host a website that is a virtual time capsule of Hopkinton past and present. We publish a bi-monthly blog distributed via email to our 658 members and use Facebook and Twitter for day-to-day -day posts. Our goal tonight is to give residents a chance to have their questions answered about the warrant articles prior to town meeting. It should also give town officials a chance to hear what de decisions residents are struggling with in advance so if they can share how they came to their vote on each article. Knowing the how and why are critical in making a good informed decision. Our hope is that people use our venue to figure out how they will be voting and better prepare them for the meeting and ultimately reducing its length. Because let's face it, it is hard to spend three to four nights in a row at the middle school and for some it gets very expensive. Important voter information you need to know Annual town meeting begins Monday, May 4th at 7 p.m. at the Middle School Auditorium. There are 57 questions on the warrant this year. Town meeting typically adjourns at 11 p.m. and continues to in consecutive evenings from 7 to 11 p.m. until all articles are voted. In recent years, town meeting has lasted two to four nights. You must attend in person to vote. A quorum of 100 people is needed to open the meeting each night. Town election is on Monday, May 18th. Polls open at 7 a.m. through to 8 p.m. at the middle school Brown Gym. Vote anytime during the polling hours. So before I introduce our distinguished panelists, and before I start in with Dr. Carlin to answer some frequently asked questions about town meeting, I just wanted to let you know that we have volunteers standing by now to receive your questions or comments by phone or email. The email is knowyourvote at educatehopkington.com or you can call 508-435-7887. You have the option to speak live or have one of our runners send me the question, but we always like to say that we like to hear new voices. Our panelists tonight are Dr. Bruce Carlin, our town moderator, Norman Kamalo, our town manager, Todd Sestari, chair of the Board of Selectmen, Dr. Kathy McLeod, superintendent, John Graziano, chair of the school committee, Ken Wisemantle, chair of the planning board. So welcome panelists and thank you for sharing your time with us. As I mentioned, we have 57 articles on the, this year's warrant. At this time, I would like to call out some articles that have drawn the most attention as we posted the warrant articles on Facebook. They are as follows. The DPW facility, multiple vehicle acquisitions, water main replacement, town and school IT safety and security upgrades, roof repairs, Fruit Street Athletic Complex, Legacy Farms, multiple land acquisitions for school and town use, and the Fruit Street Conceptual Master Plan. We are now ready to take your questions by phone or email. We also have a few questions that were submitted to us in advance to start us off. Use the information at the bottom of the screen to join the discussion. Let me begin by having Dr. Carlin mention the finer points of town meeting etiquette and any procedure you feel are important for people to know at town meeting. Thank you. This is a wonderful opportunity and Educate Hopkinton is a wonderful group to do this every year. Thank you again, Tara. Um, 
town meeting, we try to make it as simple as possible. Uh, this is not a uh, this is not the British parliamentary system where we're sticklers for the rules. It's it, we do stick by rules, but uh, generally uh, we take uh, the warrant as our uh, roadmap for doing this. At uh, six weeks before town meeting, the uh, the warrant closes. The selectmen open it before then uh, and uh, entertain articles from uh, petitioners and from uh, the various boards to get the town's business done. Uh, each of the articles is, uh, it's a warrant, which means warning. This is what we're going to talk about. And that's all you get to talk about. We, the selectmen um, have art, go article by article. And uh, eight days before town meeting, this is posted every place. Um, in the fire stations, in the schoolhouses, and uh, the churches, if I uh, remember correctly. And um, then we get to town meeting, and that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, I'll open the meeting at 7 o'clock. Um, there are some formalities about describing where people are to sit. We want everybody to sit in uh, the auditorium. We don't want people standing around. and. Uh, uh, if you have uh, something to say about an article, you come up to the mic and wait your turn, and uh, we try to get you in. Um, of course, sometimes somebody, uh, the discussion has been going a while, and somebody might uh, call the question, which is to end debate, and you might get cut off uh, because you don't have your chance to get to the mic if the town votes, yeah, we're ready to vote on this. But other than that, you tend to just move and everybody gets a chance to talk and say what they need to about the articles. And uh, we move right through. I would like to commend our town boards for their work. As I look at this warrant, it is a, a superb document. It's as good as it gets. You've had citizen volunteers that have uh, worked hard on these articles. Uh, have held multiple meetings. You've got our elected boards that, again, the same thing. Our elected officials have worked through this, and I think that uh, as you look at it, this is a, a fine document. It shows an incredible amount of work by our town, and I'm very proud uh, to you know just sort of sit in the background and referee while everybody talks about what uh, what they did for the year. Um, you know, special thanks to, to Todd and Ken. I think their, um, uh, their boards have worked exceedingly hard. And uh, you'll see before you uh, a lot of um, good uh, articles um, dealing with important problems in front of the town. Uh, but this is our chance to uh, talk them out and see how well they prepared it and uh, see if you agree with them. Thank you. Um, so for our first question, it's actually posed by me because I'm the moderator and I can. <laughs> um, I want to talk about the consent agenda and the importance of that and how we can get citizens to understand that it's a time-saving method rather than pulling the wool over their eyes. And I wonder um, who can speak to that point. Um, that, that would be me again, I think. Okay. The consent agenda is used in many towns, actually most of the towns in the uh, Commonwealth, to um, dispense with uh, articles that aren't yet ripe for uh, discussion. So when the warrant is posted, uh, when the warrant is finished six weeks uh, before town meeting, not all of the items that were on it have matured enough to, to actually be voted on. So uh, sometimes uh, a board will put an article in as a placeholder. I think we're going to be able to buy such and so a piece of equipment. And um, then it turns out that uh, the bids don't come in or, uh, or uh, they, they find uh, some alternative approach to it. And that article has been duly uh, accepted. It gets posted, but nobody wants to take an action on it. So we have a number of articles, I think there are seven this year, 
that people put those sort of placeholders in and said, no, it's not ready yet. Uh, other times, uh, other things make articles uh, such that they're, uh, um, uh, they're not ready. And sometimes there are articles that are just so obvious, you know, uh, except a 100 foot, 100 square foot parcel of land to tidy something up uh, that nobody's going to say no to. So we put all those kinds of articles into what's called a consent calendar. And at the front of the meeting, the idea is we offer the consent calendar up to the town and say, does anyone want to pull any of those articles for further discussion? Because, you know, we're, we're happy to discuss it. Uh, we have one article that shows up every year uh, where there are certain exemptions in our tax code. And uh, last year, somebody said, I want to talk about that. And when you discover that the exemptions are for uh, veterans and some elderly folks and uh, like that, they say, oh, never mind, and uh, it goes through. I will point out that uh, when we've discussed this in the past and, and um, we look at the articles that uh, we've added to the consent calendar, uh, when they come up for a vote, they pass unanimously. Uh, almost uh, uh, without exception. So the idea is for those what we consider non-controversial articles, you know, here, here's a chance, just lump them together. If you want to pull, if, if you find any of them objectionable, all it takes is one person to say, hey, I want to talk about article 20-something, uh, and you pull it, and we'll talk about it in the regular order. And then what we're, we can do under uh, the, uh, uh, the parliamentary procedure is, or, or the town meeting procedure is to, um, uh, is to uh, vote on all those that everybody said we accept. And that becomes a immediate, uh, uh, th that stands for your vote. It's equivalent to saying we're unanimous on this. And uh, all it takes is one person to say, I don't want it. I, I, I want to discuss it for some reason or other, and we pull it. Uh, but uh, we're, we're hoping that people will see that by using the consent calendar, we have the opportunity to uh, really focus on those articles where there is some controversy and people do want to discuss them and understand them better. But by using the consent calendar, we can. Um, we can just pull out uh, half a dozen or a dozen articles uh, that will shorten the meeting, uh, but will uh, intensify the uh, 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 the discussion so that we have more focused discussion. We don't waste our time with things that everybody agrees on. Okay, thank you. Um, we just got a question in. Uh, this person wrote, "I noticed there is an article for a significant amount of." school safety and security measures. What equipment is needed? Is there a change in the type of threat to our schools that warrants new security? Do you want me to start? Yes. We'll both Thank talk you. about this one. So there, there are two articles relevant to safety and the schools. The first is Article 24, and uh, that's a, an article that's looking at enhancing um, our, our um, sorry, access, access to the schools. So the first thing that we talk about and think about with the safety committee is how can we prevent access to the schools? Th that's the first um, level. We want to make sure that we ha can monitor individuals coming in, um, and we've made some improvements <coughs> along that way already. Um, but we want to continue to do that. This is working with the safety committee that in includes the fire department, police department, and the school department, <coughs> joint departments across the town, we work together as a committee to really look at our schools, look at recommendations that are being provided um, by, the, by the state, um, and aligning our schools with best practices. So that's what the first article is for. The second article was meant to be, intended to be, and that's Article 25, it was intended to be a joint article. Um, the two technology direct directors, one for the town and, and then for the schools, um, had been working very closely together. Um, and the idea there was to really improve efficiencies and to see where spending could be, where we, we, where we could realize some savings. 
Um, and in recently, well, a few months ago when there was a change and, and the technology director from the town um, left, it, it really made us take a second look at where we were with respect to that joint article. However, there were pieces in it that were critical to the plan um, that we had in place with the school safety task force. And the most important one, or, or I should say, they're all important, but we had hoped to roll this out um, in stages. The first stage being access control, the second uh, really looking at improving monitoring, and the third um, to, um, to look at perimeter control. I want to say in response to the question that no, this is not a result of, of um, any alarm that we have. It is in a result of our community and our com uh, committee looking at an enhanced lockdown protocol called ALICE. We've talked about it a lot. I've presented at school committee. I've presented at a public forum. Um, anybody who, who is interested, I have video to share, a training video. Um, it, it stands for ALERT, so ALICE stands for, is an acronym for ALERT, Lockdown, Inform, <coughs> Counter, Evacuate. And there's been a lot of training that's gone on across the town with all of our faculties, um, with our parents, we had a public forum about this. And so ALICE really made us look closely at what we're doing around monitoring through, through cameras um, and also access to the buildings. And so that's what this is in response to, in order to get us where we believe we need to be um, to meet those requirements. Did you want to add? I have nothing to add to that. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question regarding Article 20. Is the Fruit Street Auxiliary Facility to support Fruit Street, Athletic Complex, or existing homes and businesses? Who would like to take that question? <laughs> I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? <laughs> <laughs> the uh, Fruit Street Auxiliary Facility, is that going to support the new athletic complex or existing homes and businesses? Um, I'm assuming that it's referencing, you said Article 20? Yeah, Fruit Street <coughs> Water Facility Engineering Well bleed, uh, Blending, okay. $100,000. Okay. Um, maybe you can speak to that better than I could at this point. The article is intended to address water quality as well as enhancing the town's water capacity. Uh, it will support the town's water system. Okay. Thank you. Our next question is about the Irvine property. What measures will be taken to alleviate traffic on Route 85? There are multiple questions, so let's start with that one. I'll we'll go on to it next. Um, sure. So. Um, it's, a, it's a great question, and it's one that we've gotten a lot. Um, we recognize that the Irvine property is, um, having a school there will add a lot of traffic to 85 during the peak uh, pickup and drop-off hours um, for the schools. So as part <coughs> of the project, our um, architect, DRA, at, works with traffic engineers um, who will study the traffic beginning as soon as this summer. Um, on 85 and then we'll do a lot more actually sorry even before the summer before school gets out um, so that they can pay particular attention to when um, when seniors are still in school when they'll be driving to and from school so that they can make recommendations on traffic mitigation um, for the Irvine property as as this as the new location for the school um, we don't have a lot of answers yet in terms of what will that actually be um, what are the, the traffic mitigation actions that we'll need to take because that's going to be part of our process once we have secured um, purchase of the site and can begin doing the engineering for the facility. But it, it's, a, it's going to be a big part of the project, making sure that we can mitigate the traffic impact. Um, I believe you've already answered the, the second part of the question, and it's um, can Ash Street accommodate an increase in traffic due to people bypassing 85 now? And will that be part of the study? So can Ash Street accommodate? Oh, so increased traffic. Incre oh, so theoretically, people are trying to avoid Hayden Row because of the increased traffic. Right. I, I, I <laughs> imagine that will be yes. Yeah, so that that will be part of the study. Um, that they'll be they'll be looking at potential traffic impacts so that we mm -hmm. make sure we're not operating this just in a vacuum. Um, so it would be it would be part of. 
okay. what they would be looking at. And this person is looking for a light at Chestnut and 85, a real light. So, uh, sound like a broken record. Uh, again, I think this is, this is something that is, uh, I would imagine is a potential solution um, to, but I say a potential solution to a problem we haven't defined yet. So mm -hmm. we know that there will be traffic impact. We don't know how heavy it will be. We don't know exactly what that'll be. So through studying it, um, we'll be getting those recommendations. Great. Let me try those two mm -hmm. from the planning board's perspective. First of all, the Ash Street side, with moving the school from Ash Street to Hayden Row, probably will be less traffic from that aspect of, of it, because center school will not have the, uh, the traffic on it at that point. The planning board has looked at uh, the traffic light at Chestnut and Hayden Row. We looked at it extensively with Legacy Farms. We knew there was going to be an increase of traffic due to Legacy Farms. That traffic, uh, I live near there, it uh, has gotten better or, or more in the rush hour time period. Uh, that's probably one of the next intersections. Maybe not a full traffic light, but maybe some <coughs> turning lanes might be needed there in the new f near future to make, make it a little easier to get by that intersection at the peak times. But a lot of the peak times that we see traffic on that right now is not the school times. Okay. Tara, I'd just like to add is also that um, oftentimes the uh, suggested traffic calming measures, if they require extra funding, then that has to go in front of uh, town meeting as well. And I believe last year there was uh, an effort by the schools to uh, change traffic patterns or put some safety islands in front of the schools, and that was turned down by town meeting. So it's, it's not just unilateral thinking and decision making that happens, but town meeting has to be involved in the, in the solution as well. Well, to build on that, are you going to be revisiting that traffic calming, or will that wait for the new school and its plans and studies? Um, so any traffic calming that we would propose will wait for the new school and its studies. Um, so to my knowledge, um, and I, Norman, you could help me out here, I don't think the traffic calming is being brought back on this it's warrant, it's right? It's so close. so there's nothing on there, and, and <clears throat> there are probably many reasons for that, but part, one, part of it is that we know that, that if we are successful in purchasing the Irvine property as the preferred site, um, that we will have potential work to do in that area. Um, I should note as well that one thing that, that is important to note when it comes to traffic impact, especially around the school times, is that the new elementary school, the start times will be staggered. Um, so starting next year, Center and Elmwood Elementary Schools will be starting at the same time as each other. So this new school would not be starting or ending at the same time that Hopkins, the high school and the middle school do. So while it would be adding traffic to <coughs> Hayden Row at a new time, it wouldn't be adding to existing traffic per se, per existing school traffic. Thank you. Uh, our next question is about Fruit Street, specifically the athletic complex. Can that be used for non-athletic events? Should it pass, such as fairs, outdoor activities, concerts? If restricted to just soccer, football, and lacrosse, should those leagues be funding the facility? I'm interested in this one. <laughs> so referencing, um, well, I know that you're not the person who wrote the question, no. referencing uh, the new building or the facility in general? Uh, the new building. The new building? Mm -hmm. Okay. I believe currently um, the, the state of the articles that are being put in front of town meeting is for concessions and storage and restrooms. Uh, so, as of right now, there is no other part of the facility that's, that's going in front of town meeting. Okay. So, unless they want to have a concert someplace, uh, you know, in the concession stand, yeah. then... Uh, <laughs> um, and who will be manning the facility? Who will, is it fall under Parks and Rec? Or? Yeah, that's, that's uh, uh, under Parks and Rec's jurisdiction. and. Um, I believe that they're looking at different possibilities, uh, you know, ranging from uh, allowing allowing another organization to just run it, uh, possibly putting things out to bid uh, to to have the concessions managed by the highest bidder and things of that nature. But they're they're reviewing those possibilities. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is: There is an article to purchase an eighty-five thousand dollar water utility vehicle. Is this truck a replacement or an addition? Why is it needed? And how is this truck used? And we do have a picture of it. 
Anybody yes. can this, tackle us. <laughs> yes, I, I, I can. Um, it, it will be a replacement vehicle. Uh, it's used for the daily operations of the water department. Uh, we'll also be looking at the possibility of using it as a plowing truck. Okay. Uh, uh, can I just ask Norm, could you talk about the committees that we have that put the um, uh, the capital items in front of us? This isn't just a, uh, a simple, yeah, we need another one. There, there's a whole process that goes on every year, and, and I see it as the moderator where uh, where you guys go through a lot of work to say that these really need it, these can wait a year. Yes, briefly, uh, each department uh, is required to produce a capital management and replacement plan. Um, we usually look at a five to ten year period. That plan is reviewed annually by the Capital Improvement Committee. After its review, the Capital Improvement Committee forwards recommendations to the town manager, and the town manager, as part of developing the comprehensive budget, integrates the capital improvement uh, uh, plan. In addition, it, because the purchases that may be recommended in the Capital Improvement Committee require a recommendation from the Appropriations Committee, there is additional review by the Appropriations Committee. In addition, for articles that are recommended by the TPW director and the town manager, the fire chief, as well as the police chief, the board of selectmen does get the opportunity to review those requests in public. Thank you. Um, I do have to make a note to the audience, the speaker in this room is not working. So when you do call in, we are writing them on little cards and they're sending them in to me. So I apologize for that. Um, why, why, we do, why do we want to allow a marijuana dispensary in our town? How would that support the health of our citizenry? Yeah. I think that that's something that you would have to ask all the voters in town. Um, but uh, um, right now there is no plan to have a marijuana dispensary in the, town that I know of. Well, by, <laughs> by, by state law, you have to have one location within each town in the Commonwealth for, for that. You passed that, that by law allowable. last year. That would be allowable. Right, allowable. But nobody is a, has any interest to build one here, and there's only, I believe, three per Middlesex County, and Little Hopkinton is not going to get one of those three. I, 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 You've got to say, this is, this is sort of a misreading of that planning board article. Um, we need to have uh, a structure in place uh, uh, in order to uh, uh, to say yay or nay to uh, uh, people that propose something to us. So maybe you could um, um, sort of give that better context. Uh, I'm, I'm, I don't know which article that is. I, I'm not sure which article there, that, that, there, that was. Norm, do you, you know what we're talking about there? Or am I just? <laughs> we, 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 we passed we passed one last year, yeah. uh, not this year, and uh, you know it is allowed in in, in certain uh, I think the commercial and industrial areas, but uh, you know there's been no interest in coming near near Hopkinton. I, I believe Milford has got one facility, and you know the state board that regulates that feels that you know people from Hopkinton, if they need medical marijuana, can go to Milford once that gets set up. But if, if you zoned it so tightly that it was impossible for one to come in, uh, then you're opening the town to litigation. Uh, okay. So there needs to be something by law, just some place that it's plausible. And, okay. and we wrote that in a very uh, rigorous manner, such that it makes it even tougher to come here if you really want to have No drive-throughs or neon signs right there. No. <laughs> <laughs> OK, the next question was emailed in. Uh, earlier today. This person wants to know, I'd like to know why the land the town already owns on Fruit Street isn't being considered as the site for the proposed elementary school. Why are we even considering purchasing more land for a new school when the town already owns quite a bit of land on Fruit Street, most of which doesn't seem to be in use at all? This is no longer an issue of districting as it was in the past, but one elementary school for the entire town. So, um, so with respect to the, the Fruit Street property, um, it's true that it, when we went 
through this project for the elementary school building committee, uh, the educational model um, in terms of our grade span configuration for the schools was not on the table. And effectively, from an operational perspective, that eliminates the location at Fruit Street when the committee looks at available options because to, to sort of give an example, uh, children who live almost on the Holliston line um, in sort of the, in the Ravenwood or those neighborhoods would be on a bus for an extremely long time to get over all the way across town to a school on Fruit Street. Um, and it would just be impossible from a transportation perspective. So that was why we did not look at that site. Thank you. And staying with uh, the schools, uh, people are wondering why is the Tadero property still on the warrant if the Irvine property was selected for the new school? So I'm actually not going to leave that with the schools right. because <laughs> um, that's actually more. So um, we're not. So that that's that property is not related to the school for purchase. So I'll kick that to my right. 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 Yeah. So the Board of Selectmen uh, decided to put this on the warrant uh, in part in part to open a discussion. So quite often when we see different properties uh, going on the market or a piece of property being purchased by a private entity or a developer, we start hearing about, well, why didn't we buy that so that we wouldn't get a lot of new development that puts more pressure onto the schools. So what we're trying to do is uh, suggest to the town that we need to address our needs from two sides. Uh, first of all, there's a possibility that in the next, you know, I'm not sure, eight, ten years, I'm not sure if those numbers are accurate, maybe it's sooner, maybe it's later, that uh, there will be a need for another school. There are no other large properties uh, in, the, in the center of town area and it's been expressed that the desire is to keep the schools more or less in, in a clustered type of campus. Um, if we purchase that property now, the other desired effect that it has is it keeps the property off the market from these private developers. Uh, that property is close to 24 acres. Uh, there's no doubt that other developers have already started speaking with the owner. Uh, we think that the price that we've worked out with the owners is a fair price uh, and I think it's it's good for the town from many different angles. Uh, in the event that we got to a point where we didn't need a school, then the property can be considered for other things as well, whether it's uh, you know recreational activities or other municipal needs that we might have. Uh, but the property is not going to go down in value. It's not going to stay on the market for years. So it's something where if we want to consider it, we need to consider it now. Okay. Uh, the next one is one we get every year. And so I guess we need to address it every year. And it's why are the school and town budgets wrapped into one article? <laughs> I'll let you yeah. take that one. <laughs> yes. Um, the, the concept of building one motion for the town and school budgets is actually built on the whole philosophy of one town, one solution. Um, and it is also consistent with the town charter. Um, or I think a couple of the th issues that have been raised uh, in, in, in terms of the actual process uh, are, are the following. One, there, there have been questions with regard to whether combining the, the budgets uh, takes away the ability of the, of the public uh, to ask questions. Uh, that is not the case. Uh, even under the one article or one motion, uh, the public still has the ability to ask questions uh, pertaining to any of the budgets uh, uh, included in the comprehensive budget. And then secondly, as we have done, I think, over the last two or three years, the, the presentation under that article is by the Board of Selectmen, the school department, and the Appropriations Committee. And so the public still gets the opportunity to hear specifics regarding the different budgets that are included in the comprehensive budget. But finally, I think one of the attractions uh, in terms of going to a comprehensive budget uh, motion was the town's desire to articulate clearly the size, the extent, and the scope of the comprehensive budget. I think that's a great explanation of that. Thank you. Um, the next one, if the town votes to approve all articles, hopefully with no discussion, 
how much will our, what will the average tax bill be per household? Or how much will it add to the average tax bill? I don't have the, the exact specific number, but the projected tax impact of the budget as proposed is approximately 2.38 percent. Thank you. Uh, we have another question, or our first question, about uh, the fire department. And this person wants to know, could the two firefighters requested by the chief be added to the operating budget without an override? As of, as of the last version of the budget that the Board of Selectmen has reviewed, which was just on Tuesday night, uh, the answer would be no. Um, in that budget, there was, I want to say, in the area of $33,000 left in excess levy capacity. Uh, so it would be falling short by about $90,000. And their follow-up question was, why were the new firefighters requested? Is it true that the fire department hasn't seen a staffing increase since 2003-2004? Uh, as far as why they were requested, uh, that would be a question that uh, Chief Clark would have to answer. Uh, I'm sure that they were requested because the chief feels that there's a need for them. Uh, as far as when the last staffing increase uh, took place for the fire department, I don't have that. I don't have that statistic. Um, I don't know if you do. Y yes, um, the the last addition, staff addition, in terms of the operational team at the fire department was in 2003. Okay, we're going to move on. Uh, this is a question for both. Todd Sestari and John Graziano. Could, could I, I'm sorry, yeah, Tara, sure. could I just add on to that though? Mm -hmm. Because this is something that, that uh, a lot of people are questioning and it does, in the context that it was just presented, it seems like we're being a little bit unreasonable, I would say. Um, you know, I would like to point out that in the next, in the coming weeks, uh, a restructuring is going into action for the dispatch units. So historically, there were separate dispatch units for the fire department and the police department. We've been going through a, a large process that is moving all the dispatch responsibilities over to the police department. So historically, there were four people in the fire department who are certified firefighters who were mani manning the dispatch uh, responsibilities. They were not going out on the road. They were not fighting fires. They weren't doing anything other than answering the phones. So in this restructuring, what we've done is we've allowed the fire department to keep those four dispatchers and make them into firefighters again. So they are getting an additional four people in the coming weeks who are going to be able to go out on the road and actually fight fires and, and do firefighting responsibility. And what that equates to is, uh, I think it's, I was saying the other night, 18 to 20 percent, but in the actual force that goes out uh, to do those uh, functional duties, it's about a 20 to 25 percent increase in staff. So that's one of the reasons that our board took a look at the staffing and the requests and we determined that, okay, you know, we're adding to the staff, we're not neglecting the fire department, let's make sure that we're addressing the needs across the town and not simply for public safety. We all care about public safety. We don't want bad things happening to people, especially due to lack of staffing. And we are trying to address that. And uh, we're, we're obviously going to be uh, continuing to keep a close eye on the situation. And if we feel that there are further needs, then we'll address them. Great, thank you. Uh, here we have a question about our past winter. And the question is, is there an adequate amount of money to cover repairs needed due to the severe winter weather? Um, actually, the, the, the governor uh, approved a uh, supplementary budget for the, for the uh, municipalities uh, to add to the, on top of the Chapter 90 funds for the road maintenance. Um, Mr. Kamala, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what the number that Hopkinton came in with. Uh, but that's something that our DPW director is uh, obviously out at this time of year looking to see what additional damage has occurred. Um, one, of the, one of the factors that comes into, into all of this in addressing issues with roads and putting things onto a management plan 
is often just the, the timing and there's not necessarily the time to go out and repair all of the things that we would like to get to throughout a season. So, um, <coughs> but, but there were additional funds because of the harsh winter and uh, we'll, be, we'll be addressing issues as we can. Mm -hmm. yeah. in, in fact, the town received 99341 in the Winter Recovery Assistance Program Fund. From the state? Yes. Right. Um, our next question came in through Facebook, and it's about the uh, local hotel tax amendment. And the question is, we don't currently have any hotels, so why is this article being brought forward now? And what tax rate do our neighboring towns have for hotels? Yeah, so um, this is something where we actually a a approved a hotel tax a few years ago uh, without having a hotel. We had just put in a hotel overlay district. And basically the thought is if a hotel does come to town, uh, we don't want to be putting a tax in at that point or we don't want to be increasing the tax at that point. We want them to know what they're getting into when they, when they come to town. The 6% uh, across the Commonwealth out of 351 towns, uh, I want to say that it's somewhere, I think it's in the area of 100 towns have a 6% tax rate on the hotels right now. Uh, as far as area towns to us, I know that Milford has a 6%, Framingham has 6%, Southboro has 6%, Shrewsbury has 6%. Um, Marlboro has 6%. The, o the only town that didn't, uh, excuse me, that does have a hotel tax that stayed at 4% so far, and of course this is still, uh, you know, town meeting season, was uh, Northboro, I believe. Uh, so that was the only one that I saw on the list. So we're, we're not pricing ourselves out of the neighborhood. Okay. Um, this is the one I was going after earlier. Um, and it's being addressed to Todd and John. Can you talk about the key strategic initiatives in the town and school operating budgets, respectively? Sure. What's the start? <laughs> um, you know, we, yeah, there's, there's a few things that we'd like to do, and uh, Norman and I were talking about this this morning. Um, one of the things that we want to do, in addition to various land purchases and things of that nature, uh, is uh, continue to address OPEB. Um, you know, OPEB is an obligation that we have, and uh, just to give a little bit more explanation for, for folks who aren't sure what that is, uh, it's basically our obligation to employees who have left the employment of the town, uh, other than pensions. So it often includes things like health insurance, possibly life insurance, dental, vision, and things of that nature. Uh, our, our current OPEB responsibility is in the area of 19 million dollars um, if there, there's a couple of options for funding that uh, you can fund OPEB responsibilities through pay as you go uh, which basically means each year you're just going to continue to collect taxes and uh, pay for all these expenses for these retirees or you can prefund and by prefunding you gain uh, significant advantages um, and basically that would lower our obligation by somewhere in the area of four million dollars. So that's, that's been something that we've been trying to work on for a few years and uh, we brought consultants in this year. We feel we're on the right track and we need to continue, uh, continue doing that, uh, funding the OPEP. Um, there's also the reserve fund and we want to continue uh, funding the reserve fund. Um, Typical metrics are that we should be in the area of 5% of our total budget for the reserve fund. And right now, I want to say we're in the area of 3%. So we want to continue building that up. Uh, basically, you know, a rainy day fund, you know, there may be years in the future where our growth uh, doesn't continue to help our, our budgetary needs. And so we need to make sure that we're prepared for that. But from a financial standpoint, those are the two primary things. Uh, you know, and then the other thing is we're continuing to uh, listen to what the folks in town have to say. And uh, we had the visioning group uh, last year who came up with the town vision statement and they put out uh, what a lot, a lot of people feel was yet another survey trying to find out what people are looking for, what amenities in town, what services. 
And so we're uh, continuing to try to address those. Uh, and part of that is in the land acquisitions that we're pr uh, presenting people, whether it's the Tadaro property or the Pratt property, uh, things of that nature. We're trying to uh, suggest ways that we can keep these properties off the market, put less pressure on the uh, infrastructure of our school system, and also keep some of that character that people really move to the town for. Right. Um, with respect to the schools, uh, we're continuing to build on the strategic plan um, that, that was adopted last year. Um, first and foremost, around the area of aligned curriculum, um, we are continuing to develop our curriculum to keep it up to date and um, in accordance with the Massachusetts State Frameworks. Um, so we have uh, increases to STEM opportunities as well as other curriculum, curriculum enhancements. Um, we have a significant portion of our strategic initiative budget is increased programming for our high needs learners, specifically targeting the level two school designations that we have um, within the district. Um, and then um, technology integration. Um, is, is a key one and then professional development um, continuing to build up effective school leadership um, we have had we have a, a, a tremendous administrative team um, but continuing to develop them um, so that they can deliver the, the best outcomes for their students I think what you see the theme this year as you saw last year um, under Dr. McLeod's first budget is that the focus of the strategic initiatives is how can we deliver the most value in the classroom and so it's it's all really focused on how can we improve those individual student outcomes within the classroom great thank you john um the next one i've been holding off on this one but uh the dpw um this caller wants to know why is it so expensive will we be receiving any grant money and do we have to do this all at once? Um, yeah, you know, buildings are expensive. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think uh, the DPW is coming in just over $14 million. Um, about half of that is actually for the building itself. Uh, but then you've also got various other things. You need, there's equipment that needs to be brought in there for the, for the DPW building. There's the salt shed, there's the fuel island. All of this also comes with uh, different regulations that need to be met. And those regulations, uh, whether they're environmental or, or safety, they cost money to implement. Um, the building is being configured so that it is possible to add on to. Uh, however, right now we're really looking at what we, what we feel is the base configuration for our starting point. Uh, we do feel that the building as it's being presented will take the town uh, through you know the next you know 15 years anyway um, but uh, it's it's really being presented in, in what's considered to be the uh, the, the starting point Kat, yes Mark, could I just ask a question what does a building like this generally cost I, I didn't think that that was so much for a uh, uh, Department of Public Works facility do you have comparables um, you know really when when you're looking at comparables you're looking at uh, cost per square foot and this is coming right into the into the ballpark of what we see all around it's it's not higher than others I mean it may be higher than some but it's not higher than uh, others and uh, you know we've really when this first came in it was around 16 million Right. Yes, and and through value engineering, that number was brought down to fourteen point one million. Yeah, uh, as far as grants go, um, there is there are no grants that we know of uh, to help build DPW facilities, unless we put a bunch of books in it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe some classrooms. Yeah. Yeah. Put those in too. Um, we have had a slowing in our phone calls, so you at home, if you have any questions, feel free to call in. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to ask the panel if they have any info they want to get out to the voters while we're waiting for more phone calls to come in. Ken? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's looking for Ken. Well, okay. The planning board sponsored uh, 
10 zoning articles and we had one citizen petition for the 11th zoning article. So that's kind of on the high side for the planning board. And we also sponsored another, I think, seven uh, articles. Uh, there's two or three of those articles that will probably take a lot of the discussion, though there's always one that we don't expect any discussion on that seems like it goes on forever. But uh, the uh, changes to the Osmud, the uh, legacy farms, age restricted units, that is probably one that will get uh, its share of discussion. Um, we have a, a bunch of articles that basically make it easier for people that are applying to do something in town. Uh, we have a couple of them that are just housekeeping to, I'll say, reorganize where the zoning bylaws read or, or portions are so that you don't have to be a zoning ar a lawyer uh, or the town planner to even read through and find what's applicable to what you're trying to do. So there's two or three in that area. There's two or three or two in signs and in lighting that kind of clarify to applicants what the planning board's been approving for a while. And that'll make it a lot easier for people to understand what they should submit the first time so that they don't have to re-engineer it a second time after we say no. So basically we're trying to be a little more uh, specific on what, what we're trying to, to get from them. You, you do often say yes. We, well, I mean, from a site plan <laughs> review, unless there is an intractable reason which means that you cannot put a condition on it, you have to say yes, if it is allowed within the zoning. So, you know, most of the time we do say yes, but also the planning board and particularly the planning office meets with all sorts of people who want to do something that is outside our zoning, and we say to them at that first informal secretive meeting, no, you can't do that in town. We don't allow that in town. And then, then they just go away with that. So you don't hear all the times we say no. So anyway. Now you did approve the Legacy Farm Warren article, correct? Yes, we did. It, all, all 11 of the zoning articles have been uh, recommended by the full planning board. I mean, that, well, not all of them unanimous, but, uh, but they did make a majority vote on all of them. Most of them were unanimous recommendations. And can you explain to the viewers why you chose to approve Legacy Farms and how you came to that conclusion? Sure. Uh, basically, Legacy Farms uh, adds 180 age-restricted um, uh, units and takes away uh, the commercial office park area up in the north corner of, of, of Legacy Farms. Uh, the Board of Selectmen did a pretty good job of revising with the developer the host community agreement. And basically, if this, ar I, I, <laughs> if, if this article passes, there's a total of a, a million eight hundred and sixty thousand dollars that ends up coming to the town uh, over and above if it doesn't pass. Uh, these 180 units actually have less traffic than the commercial. If they built up that as office space, there would be more uh, peak hour traffic going in and out of that area than, I'll say, 180 uh, <coughs> folks that are, you know, age restricted. Uh, it's it's kind of well. My mother lives in one of the original Del Webb uh, communities. Del Webb is now owned owned by Pulte and you know it's a community they're they're expecting 180 they'll probably have a pool maybe a tennis court or something some amenities and it'll be a social group for for people that are uh, starting to be my age I guess uh, but uh, you know it, it's a something that it's a it's a senior housing that we really don't have in town so uh, you know I think it's a, a, a new amenity uh, for it it also allows the project to move forward a little bit faster because, uh, you know, they're still building at a good clip the, uh, I'll say, the normal condominiums. Uh, they're being very successful on that, but uh, they still have more to build on the south side before they get to the north side. This with a different product type, they could start a little bit faster on the north side. So really it's, it's 
financial benefits, less traffic. Uh, the revenue from that, from, from, from property taxes, is about a million and a half uh, net of town services a year, too. So it's, it's, it's a good, it, it, the planning board uh, uh, voted for that uh, with only one descending vote. Right. And Ken, the minute people heard your voice again, our email started coming in again. Good. <laughs> and a phone call. Uh, this emailer says, I'm having a hard time ex accepting the net revenue and traffic impact statistics that Legacy Farms is promising <coughs> with the change in the approved development plan. So he has two questions. One, has Hockington done an independent assessment of the traffic and revenue impacts of the proposed changes to Legacy Farms? and have the previous legacy farm projections on traffic and net revenue been accurate? Well, let's, let's start with the last question first. Uh, I believe that we've actually had a little less traffic than what was really proposed. There was uh, several of the uh, early traffic studies looked at the project as a whole and looked at it as the worst case for traffic generators. and. What has actually been approved and selected, if, uh, particularly in the commercial area where we have a uh, senior housing assisted living center, that has significantly less traffic than if that had been a, uh, a shopping center in, on that, in that area. So the traffic from the original projections is a lot less than, than where we're at. It's still high, and, and you know, if you live on East side of Hopkinton uh, at certain times it's really tough to get to the center of, of town. Uh, from a revenue standpoint, the fact that the town has got all this extra money to spend on all these new people and all these new programs and all these new initiatives is a lot due to Legacy Farms, not only the building permit fees that are one time coming in, but the condo prices have been significantly higher uh, than I thought they were going to be. I mean, uh, people are spending a lot of money to come to Hopkinton. I keep saying that Hopkinton, there's four reasons why people come to, uh, to Hopkinton, location, 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 and then the schools. And so, um, you know, that's kind of a, a play on the old realtor joke, but uh, it, it's, I, The Osmond is, is a different type of zoning than what we've seen in Hopkinton a lot. Uh, it's not for everyone that wants to live there, but they're selling approximately 60 of those units a year. In fact, they sold the, the week we had that really bad storm. I believe they put 10 units under agreement when, when the snow was about three feet high. Just trying to figure out which one was the really bad storm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Ken. Yep. Um, we have a caller that uh, wants to go back to the DPW. Um, their question is, will the new DPW budget include salaries for more employees? And it is the only building that is 4.1. How does it break down across the building, the equipment, and the employees? The, the, yeah, the proposed FY16 DPW budget does not include funding for additional employees who I think as the question may imply may be necessitated by the larger building. Okay. If this one just ends, sorry. Uh, when will the town manager give an update on position analysis and pay classification plan? The, the plan is to actually have a work session with the selectmen following uh, the annual town meeting. Okay. Right. Thank you. Um, one of the warrant articles is about Pratt Farm. Uh, there is no dollar amount on it right now, so we're wondering what are the plans for Article 48? Yeah, so um, a few months ago uh, we were approached with an opportunity to have discussions with the Pratt family uh, about the, the property that they have on Fruit Street. That property, uh, I was just talking before, before this, I was talking with Kathleen and, and we were talking about how beautiful a piece of property it is. 
Um, basically, what is being proposed at this point, and, and first of all, I'd like to thank one of our, our my fellow board members, uh, Ben Paleko, as well as um, uh, Mike Manning and, and uh, Mr. Kamalo. Uh, they've done an incredible amount of work on this, uh, meeting with various parties and trying to figure out something that could work. Basically, uh, right now, the way things would stand is there's 43 acres, and that property would be purchased. Uh, there would be some acreage that continues to be tied to an existing house that's on the property, and <coughs> that house would remain there. Uh, there would be seven acres that are set aside for agricult agricultural purposes only. And then the remaining acreage, uh, 32, 33 acres, uh, would be conveyed to the town. Uh, at any point, if that seven acres ceases to be used for agricultural purposes, or if they wanted to sell that seven acres, two of the, two of the seven would be conveyed to the town, and then the remaining five could be sold. And those five acres are structured so that there's three building lots. So basically, the purchase of this property would give us uh, four, uh, well, 38 acres in the end, and with the possibility of only three homes going on that entire property. There's also a deed restriction uh, that the seller is putting in place that uh, creates an opportunity for the local scouts to build a lodge on a portion of the property. Uh, so that would be doing something that's positive, it's bringing some good use, some good community use, uh, and it's, uh, it's allowing the scouts to <coughs> Uh, have some of the function and it's all scouts not just boy scouts cub scouts or girl scouts or um, or brownies it's all of them together uh, they would all be able to use that property as well um, am I missing anything out of those details there, yeah there there the, this this was this was a deal that um, it, it was something that was uh, maybe not a long time in the making uh, if you don't consider three months a long time uh, but there were there was a lot of time that was spent in those three months. It was a very concerted effort, and uh, it's something that the board of selectmen um, firmly stands behind. We think it's a good idea. It helps to preserve uh, the rural character going down Fruit Street. If this is another one of those situations where we know that there are developers out there who would love to get their hands on all 43 acres or even a portion of that 43 acres, uh, it's something that could easily be put out there on the commercial market and we could end up with uh, you know I would say no fewer than than 30 houses built into that area and then we would see you know more pressure on the schools <laughs> uh, then you know that that Tadaro property might be used <laughs> uh, sooner rather than later uh, and and it would also be taken away from the character so uh, we think that um, the, the deal is a good deal and uh, we're, we're hoping the town sees sees it that way as well Great, thank you. Um, we have a caller um, that needs a follow-up from Mr. Wisemantle. Um, has the town done an independent revenue traffic assessment of legacy farms, or are we trusting legacy farms assessments? Oh, yes, I forgot to answer <laughs> that. Yes, uh, Judy Barrett uh, did the uh, revenue uh, numbers and has verified those from the town. She did the original legacy farms uh, studies, uh, and, and we had our traffic folks look at the, at the at the traffic numbers also. So yes, we we believe that the traffic numbers are good good projections from that. Right. Thank you. Another follow up question. Um, this is written weird, but it's three hundred and fifty thousand for public safety. Now, will this be distributed between the fire department and the police department? This is money coming from Legacy Farm. There is three hundred and sixty thousand uh, dollars to be paid uh, over th in three payments uh, for public safety. Uh, basically, the rationale I believe for that part of the host community agreement was that uh, the senior population. While they don't use the schools, they do use the ambulance service a lot, and the ambulance service is, is, is responded to by both uh, the fire department and the police department on every call. So, you know, it'd be depending on where the needs for either of those two be up to the Board of Selectmen seeing what the usage might be for that uh, to, uh, 
to, to determine where where it goes. But it it is earmarked for uh, uh, public safety and infrastructure uh, mitigation uh, in the host community agreement. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go back to our email questions. Um, this is concerning Article 21. And the person writes, I know that several homes on Grove Street and surrounding streets have complained about water pressure. I have been told through various conversations with neighbors that our low water pressure issues stem from the fact that our water is gravity fed from this tank and why our pressure is lower than normal. If that information is in fact true, will the new tank help or resolve the Grove Street water pressure issue? Or is what I have been told about our water pressure incorrect? Submitted by uh, Bonnie on Grove Street. I'll take that one. As a former water and sewer commissioner, uh, it is gravity fed from that tank. We do pump to that tank and and the uh, Grove Street tank was put on the hill <coughs> at that point uh, to try to serve the town. Uh, it's the water is at the same elevation as the, the tank that's over on West Main Street. Uh, the water level is the same between the two tanks. Uh, if you live close to Grove Street tank or if you live close to the the tank that's at West Main Street and School Street, a lot of people have supplemental pumps to, uh, to, to build up the pressure in, in your house. If it happens to be a summer day or whatever and the demand is low, and particularly if the fire is there, yeah, it, it, the tank gets lower and you lose that much more feet of pressure uh, to, to, to add to it. But uh, I don't believe there's any plans to go to a two-level uh, pressure system or anything like that. It, you know, if, if you don't have enough pressure for your shower, the, the best way f would be to put a supplemental pump on, on your system. Okay, so it's unfortunate that the phones aren't working because we're getting a lot of phone calls right now since we brought up Legacy. Uh, this caller wants to know if we have received so much revenue from Legacy Farms, then why are we continually asked to pay more to expand town services? Shouldn't revenue from Legacy Farms have covered that? <laughs> yeah, uh, you know we have we have uh, gotten a considerable amount of revenue through Legacy Farms. Um, I think that what you find is even in towns where they aren't experiencing growth like that and they don't have sources of of new revenue such as Legacy Farms, their taxes still go up. Uh, we've gone through a number of years, and I think that uh, well the board of selectmen, the boards that I've been on. We have uh, really put a focus on trying to minimize the impact uh, on, on the taxpayers as we went through a difficult fiscal period. Um, the fact of the matter is, as you're trying to minimize that impact over some years, there is a point where there's only so much you can do and you need to start doing a little bit of catch up. And so uh, while we have not neglected things, We've put a lot of plans in place. We've done the studies trying to figure out priorities of uh, the capital asset management plans and things of that nature. And we have addressed areas that we felt were critical. Now we're at a point where we also need to start uh, catching up and, uh, and again, starting to supplement for other, uh, for other areas that may have been lacking. And another thing that I would like to, um, I would like to remind the, the caller as well as all the other uh, taxpayers in town was last year we passed an underride and so that underride indicated that we were not taxing to our full levy capacity over the prior years and essentially what we were doing with that underride was uh, giving the control of that excess levy capacity back to the taxpayers so what we what we could have done, uh, you know, had had uh, we not done the underride, was continue to let that build. But as we see areas where we want uh, wanted and, and town meeting, of course, would approve, uh, where we wanted to make spending adjustments, you could end up with more than a two and a half percent increase in your taxes. But it's because you're using some of that excess levy capacity from prior years that that you didn't use. And so the, the net effect is we would have been able to go in with a budget that would result in, let's say, a 6% increase in taxes from one year to the next, but we're still not requiring a, a, uh, an override. 
Uh, so we're trying to give that control. Well, we did give that control back to the back to the townspeople where the control belongs. And so each year now we're being kept uh, to that two and a half percent uh, as we go in front of the town meeting members. So. I, I'd just like to point out that uh, we have our finance committee that meets very regularly and discusses all of these issues to uh, um, make sure that we're spending wisely. And uh, we've got wonderful volunteers that uh, have the same concerns that uh, the caller had about are we doing this wisely. You can come to the meetings. They're, they're not very well attended except by the members of the uh, various boards. But um, this is uh, a very uh, finely hashed out budget every year. And uh, hopefully, you know, uh, we appreciate everybody that comes to town meeting uh, once a year, but there's stuff going on all year to ask these same questions in perhaps even a tougher way than uh, the, the, the caller did that really parses this budget very, very finely to make sure that we're getting bang for our buck. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Carlin. And, and I guess, you know, in the end, uh, you know, we got to remember that, that the volunteers who are on these different committees, we're all taxpayers too. And so we want to uh, mind our wallets right now, but at the same time, we want to protect our property values. So, you know, we're all out there, you know, trying to do what we think is right for everyone, not just ourselves. Those are great points. And I think that's something that we have to be mindful of at town meeting, is that we all are citizens of this town, and we're not trying to fight against each other. We're trying to work for a common goal, which is affordable taxes. Um, switching subjects a little bit, uh, a caller asked how much has been spent this year on attorney's fees and what is the projection for next year? Just a caller. Yes, yeah, strictly uh, based on um, the budget, we are projecting to spend 150000 on legal fees. We have identified perhaps an additional 80,000 that may be required to augment that account for the simple reason of uh, the number of litigation cases that we have had to attend to uh, this year. Okay. If I could just and that, sorry. Yeah. And, and, that, and that, that, that number or those numbers uh, cover general town council services, special labor council services, and cable services uh, attorneys as well. And that's, I'd just like to add that, that that's something that uh, a few years ago, uh, Mr. Kamalo renegotiated our contract with town council. We actually started looking at, uh, we, we started putting it out to bid essentially, and Mr. Kamalo was able to strike a very beneficial deal for the town um, in, in keeping him on retainer. Uh, but then at the same time, there are situations that go outside the borders of that retainer agreement. Um, each year, there's no way for us to predict the lawsuits that may come in against the town or ways that, that the town needs to protect itself. Uh, so we always try to be mindful of that and, and use as little legal fees as we can, uh, but at the same time, protect the town from, from, uh, uh, for its own good. Yeah, I was just going to sort of pile onto that a little bit. Is that I think it's a, it's a number that jumps out at people in the budget and that people look for, but there is a lot of active management that goes on in terms of making sure we're using those legal fees to protect the town only when it's necessary. I know um, I, I personally have observed Mr. Kamalo at the elementary school building committee meetings really looking at um, for some of the standardized work that comes from the Massachusetts School Building Authority, do we really need to use outside counsel to review a contract that we can't edit? Um, where where the the now it sounds sort of it sounds simple when you say it that way, but a lot of towns would run everything like that through their council. So it is something that's actively managed, um, and while the number may look high, um, it's something that we all watch very closely. Dr. I Brown? would remind people of John Glenn's comment as he was circling around uh, for the very first time. He said, uh, "It's a little bit." Uh, I forget his exact words, but it's a little bit uh, sobering to think that this was built by the low bidder. Uh, and I think we're <laughs> at the same spot there with, uh, with legal counsel. You want really good legal counsel. 
and I've been um, certainly at the town meeting I've, I've had the feeling that our legal counsel has been top-notch mm -hmm. so um, however you're mm -hmm. doing it I think uh, keep it up great thank you um, we are limited on time but we do have emails about the roof repairs at Hopkins and the high school um, first comment is that these are fairly new buildings why do they need such extensive repairs and how did the solar panels affect the roofs um, so with respect to the the age of the buildings actually dr. Carlin's comment couldn't have been better time right, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it was like you set it up for us um, what we've discovered in in looking at these roofs as we've had the analysis done is that um, when these roofs were put on they were done um, to a low bid basically um, roof installation and that is certainly something that um, well almost none of us who were involved in that process are, are still a part of it it's something that we we have learned from um, that it is worth the investment to make sure that we are um, that we are achieving that, that we're achieving the best solution long term long term for the facility obviously investing in these these capital assets is important and keeping them up um, is important so um, as we go through this project, one of the things we're looking for is the longevity as well, and not simply the, the low bid solution to replace this. And actually, to be honest, it's one of the reasons why the number is probably larger than we had initially anticipated. Um, I know when these were put on the capital asset management plan, they were looked at more as repair opportunities. But when our consultant got up there on the roof <coughs> um, this past winter, I guess, um, and did more infrared testing they discovered that the damage was more extensive and it needed more extensive work and that were we to do the patch repair work that we had originally um, anticipated we would have ended up only buying ourselves a couple more years and it would have been throwaway work and we would have had to have been doing this um, in a couple of years anyway we would have not have recognized any savings so um, as we looked at it on recommendations from the administration the committee decided that we really needed to bite the bullet um, and do the repairs now um, the Appropriation Committee spent a lot of time looking at this article with us. Um, they gave it a great deal of scrutiny, and <coughs> they too came to the conclusion that this was the right investment at this time. Um, with respect to the solar panels on the high school, this is sort of the perpetual question um, in terms of the installation method for those solar panels. And I know we've, we had some repairs that were done to the high school roof a few years ago that were specifically related to the solar panel uh, installation. Um, following those repairs, it was certified that the repairs that were done recertified the roof. And Gale Associates, our consultant, came in and they did not attribute any of the high school roof damage specifically to the solar panel installation at this time. Thank you. May I add, because I've been, I've been uncharacteristically quiet during this whole discussion, <laughs> so I've got to jump in somewhere where I may. Um, so I, I just wanted to add that we were, we also, uh, the Gale Associates, we, we've been very pleased with them um, and with the information that they gave us. And most recently, and very importantly to this question, um, was that these, these um, issues with our roofs have not been a result of poor maintenance. And he gave us examples of that, about how he gets up in roofs and, and the filth and the dirt, and, and we talked about the importance of maintenance and that these, these photos that you're seeing here are not attributable to poor maintenance, but rather um, that, as John said, that we, we went for a low bid and we used uh, inexpensive materials to install. And to that point and the cost of the project, um, the, the information that we've been provided with is that in order to do a roof that will last 25 plus, plus plus years, um, we, we need to be using different materials next time around. And so the estimate that has been provided to us that's resulting in the cost um, presented in the article um, is including a different material, and I can't tell you exactly what it was, but it is something that is, um, it, th there is a warranty on it for 25 plus years to last. Um. The, only, uh, the other thing I would add is too is when you see that number, um, it's important to remember with all these capital articles that's <coughs> that's the that's the outer limit of, of the borrowing that we're looking for. So we expect that this roof replacement will cost up to 1.1 million dollars. A couple years ago, we did a roof repair for the Elmwood roof, and I think the borrowing max there was around 1.4, if I remember, <coughs> and we ended up coming in two or three hundred thousand dollars short of that. 
And what happens in that case is we just don't borrow. We, we just don't borrow that much. It just costs us less. So when people see that number, it's important to know that that is our our outside limit number, and that we're going to do everything we can to keep that cost down. But in order to give us the freedom to borrow, we need to put that maximum number out there. Great point. Uh, and staying with the schools because you want you haven't talked enough. Thank you. Um, <laughs> The resurfacing of the basketball and tennis courts. We yes. had two Facebook questions about them. Uh, the first one is, uh, was this damage done by the ice rink that was placed on the uh, courts over the winter? The second question is, is this only for the tennis courts at the high school or does it include Reed Park as well? So it's only for the high school. Okay. And no, it was not caused by the ice rink. In fact, when we met with Parks and Rec, uh, and, and he talked about this last night, when we met with them, it was um, really supposed to be a pilot, a pilot project to see would this ice rink be used by the community? Um, and going into the request to use that space, it was because it was central, it was because there was lighting, um, easy access, parking. Um, it was knowing that these uh, a areas already needed to be resurfaced. So the damage that we're looking at, and we're not seeing it in, in the slide, um, it would be Article 28. Uh, the damages that we see in the photos were not caused by the ice rink um, at all. And I might add that it was really well used until it got buried in snow. Uh, <laughs> but it was a wonderful, wonderful opportunity as it is to see I mean every single night all summer long all spring and summer long there are people from the schools but but also from the community using the, <coughs> that area every single night it's a wonderful space to have um, and uh, we we really enjoy the fact that we that it is central that it's lit and and people can enjoy the spaces so yes um, and in sticking with you, uh, we have a caller uh, that says, can you speak about the specific changes the school would be making to security and safety within the 200,000? It seems so low. We went into this earlier. So I, I'll, I'll just say, so we, we can give general guidelines. Um, in these scenarios, I just, the one guidance I just want to give is we want to be very careful to talk about the specifics of safety and security upgrades because obviously for reasons that most people can, can understand, we don't necessarily want to get into specifics that talk about either what's not working, what may not be working right now, or or what would affect procedures in the future. But with that, I'll, I'll let Thank Dr. You. McLeod kind of give the guidance on that. Right. So, um, so the, the caller said that it seemed low, mm -hmm. and I want to point mm -hmm. out that um, our requests mm -hmm. are are based on a plan that we have that that the school safety committee puts together. So we're, we will ask for what we need, knowing that there are other things that will be needed in the future. We prioritize what needs to happen first, um, and then knowing that we, we're not going to come forward and ask for everything all at once. And so the priority, you've heard me talk about enhanced lockdown. Um, it has to do with, with enhanced lockdown, but it also has to do with, with access. And so in a, general, in a general fashion, I can address the fact that um, if they think it's it seems low, that's good. Uh, I'm glad to hear that. Um, but it's only part of what we're asking because we're also looking potentially um, to still get additional safety items um, through Article 25. Yes. Thank you. Well, that about wraps up the question and answer portion of the night. I just want to thank uh, the members of Educate Hopkington for working behind the scenes, answering phone calls, and running those little cards up to me. Um, first, we had Erin Graziano, Christy Willitson, Mary Puella, Amy Ritterbush, Nancy Cavanaugh, Nanda Barker Hook, Amanda Fargiano, Hope Heyman. So I just want to thank you all for helping. It is a tradition here at Know Your Vote that we take bets on how long our panelists think that town meeting would last. We need an estimated amount of days and the time we will adjourn. So I can start with our first panelist, Norman. I do have a standard answer. It's 45 minutes, but in this <laughs> case... <laughs> you can stick with that one again this year, but... Yeah. In this case, I, I, I'm hoping it will be two days and we'll adjourn on Tuesday at 10.30. 10.30. Mr. Sestari. Well, I'm hoping that Norman's right <laughs> with the 45 minutes, but uh, I think it's going to be three days. 
I think that we will be adjourning Wednesday at 9.30. But I also think that we're not going to, well, no. I, yeah, I'm just going to stick with Wednesday at 9.30. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Graziano? So I'm going to be slightly optimistic, and I'm going to say Tuesday, but I think we'll go past 11 on Tuesday to try to finish it off. So I'll say Tuesday at 11.30. I want to know what the prize is. I forgot to mention that. So every spring we have a fundraiser. Um, it's called Flocking. And we stick little pink flamingos in people's yards all around town. And with this money we raise money for, we give it to the vets at the senior center. We order banners for the town, uh, highlighting town meeting this week, which you'll see up at the tennis courts and on town hall. Um, so that, you, as a winner of this, you will be able to throw out the first flock wherever you would like it in town. Okay. Um, I am going to say Wednesday, I'm with Todd, I think we'll go into the third day, um, but I don't think we'll go to 9.30. I'm going to say Wednesday at 8.30. Mr. Wisemantel. It all depends on how fast Bruce gets going on the first article. <laughs> but I'm going to assume he's going to speed it up this year because he's been telling us to speed it up. And, and we'll move through all the pomp and ceremony and, and get right into the articles. At that, I say it's Wednesday at 1145. Ooh. 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 I bet. Do I have to be there for the whole thing? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I was just going to say, is it fair that Bruce gets to guess you? He seems to have more control over the outcome. <laughs> <laughs> so true. He is a panelist. Uh, so Thursday. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm going with you, John. I, I'm, I'm thinking Red, that. I like it. Uh, um, what'd you say? Tuesday, 1145? Yeah, I think I said Tuesday, 11:45. Yeah, I, I think that's about right. You're going to stick with the same one. Yeah. You're going to split the flock. <laughs> but okay. All right. Well, I just want to thank you all, all the panelists, for joining us tonight. <laughs> and thank you to HCAM for being so helpful in guiding us through this process of setting up our own TV show. If you would like to stay informed about town meeting, town election, and other local school and town budget issues, please subscribe to our emails and at our website at educatehockington.com. I do have another note. Uh, I did in the beginning of the meeting have the wrong date for the election. It is Monday, May 18th at the middle school. So the 20th. So it is the 18th. Uh, you can also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Thank you very much and go vote. <laughs>